Jeśli nie macie nic przeciwko, będę mówił po angielsku, bo pracuję po angielsku, cała dokumentacja Terraforma jest po angielsku i bym się po prostu czuł głupio mówiąc po polsku, bo co chwila bym wtrącał angielskie zdanie, więc po prostu nie będę robił z siebie małpi, będę mówił po angielsku. Um, so yeah, um, thanks for coming. Today's presentation is about Terraform. Uh, it's about infrastructure and I called it React for your infra. And hopefully once you see what Terraform is all about, you'll understand why I compare it to um, React. A um, few words about me. My name is Marcin Mushinski. Um, my main passion is for infrastructure and dev tools. I'm a former DevOps, spent uh, seven years at Google, a year at Facebook. Uh, I was a CTO for two years for a software house and a startup, a failed startup. I'm currently a consultant. I do dev tools for a company called Deliveroo. Deliveroo is like Uber Eats, but British and Australian. Um, and I'm driving a company-wide platform change efforts. I'm working with Terraform on a daily basis. Um, I'm available for hire. Yes, I can help you with your infra, but not for free. I'm not associated in any shape or form with HashiCorp. They don't pay me for doing this talk, but full disclosure is that I am on their customer advisory board. But it's not a paid position, nothing like that. I just like their products. Um, a few words for those who've been living in the rock for the last couple of years um, is infrastructure as code. It's a cool concept that you can manage your operations environment the same way you, op you manage applications, effectively through code. And rather than manually having this sysadmin that knows everything about everything and has all the secret passwords to all sorts of systems, you effectively have like a repo that everyone can review and everyone can, can see how it works and it's um, version and you know it's peer reviewed and you know maintained, etc. Um, so effectively you, you deal with your applications the same way as you deal with infrastructure, or you deal with infrastructure the same way you deal with applications. However, um, I emphasize that infra as code is not just about infrastructure. So it's not about your EC2 servers, it's not just about your you know, Linux boxes, it's about all the operations that you've got. And um, in this talk, I'm actually gonna spend more time talking about operations than talking about infrastructure, because people know or have been you know, privy to things like um, AWS CloudFormation, or even some of you might have used Terraform before. Um, but I'm gonna show you how, how it fits into this whole operations flow. So as a first teaser, let me show you how you could create a Heroku app with database and logs in, in Terraform. You create one resource, you name it's the resource is Heroku app. Uh, you give it a name, you give it a region, and then you can put some configuration variables, environment variables that will be available for the application. And then there is an add-on, it's a database add-on. You link it to this particular app, and you choose a plan. It's a hobby basic application, sorry, hobby basic database, so the one that is for free. And then you add a log drain so that you get logs to, I don't know, your um, logly or uh, paper trail, what have you. And that's it. If you want to create another application, you just change a name or you know make it a module and your application is up in, in a couple of seconds. So that's it, that's, you know, that's a more traditional way of doing infrastructure as code. Heroku is still infrastructure, believe it or not. But more interestingly, uh, we can do something like this with GitHub uh, organization and team membership. Imagine you have a big company, or even a small company, but like a company where people change projects. Maybe it's a software house with a couple of teams. Each team is working for a different client, and they need access to different um, resources. And when they leave the team or leave the company, they need their access removed. And, you know, shit like that. So you can create a GitHub membership in the organization. Again, it's GitHub membership. There's a username and you give it a role in the organization. There's a GitHub team. You can create a team using Terraform. Let's call it DevTools. And we've got GitHub team membership. That's it. Your GitHub membership is done. Um, normally what you do with Terraform 
this is, this is pretty repetitive, right? So normally what you do at Terraform is you use modules. So imagine your company hires a new engineer and then you have uh, you know, resources like that that you group and then expose it as a module. A module is effectively like a parameterized files in, in Terraform. You effectively, it's, it's like a function where you pass variables and those resources get you know, filled with those variables. Um, so imagine a new guy joins in, Martin joins in, so you add to your list of engineers, you add a module, engineer, and it, you know, it's, it's Martin, and here's all the teams that, that, that Martin belongs to. Now again, if that was just about GitHub teams, that's not that, you know, that's not so great, right? But it could be actually doing anything. There's a ton of providers, I'm gonna show you all the providers, but this little piece of um, configuration could add a new engineer to a couple of things. So, you know, maybe give him access to Heroku apps, only the Heroku apps he needs to be in. Uh, pager duty, AWS, it could add them to Sentry, give them access to Datadog. It could actually create a dev server for you on, on AWS using your GitHub uh, public key as your SSH key to, to your S, uh, AWS EC2 server. That EC2 server could actually be in the same VPC as your production infrastructure, so that could be a bastion host to your, to your whole infrastructure, and that would be done in, in, in a matter of minutes or even seconds. Actually, EC2 machines take a little bit longer to spin up, but, you know, I tried. Um, or even, it could register you with the company internal systems. So imagine a new guy comes in and he needs to be paid and there is a system for managing payments. This particular piece of code could actually interface with your Salesforce with whatever HR software you're using and it could set him up for payments. Now I'm not sure if it's so good to keep um, payment records in Git, although like if, if you're a big believer in, in dramatic or transparency, I, I don't know, you, you could do it, right? Uh, or you could put uh, payments data in Vault and then have stuff taken directly from Vault, whatever, right? This is super powerful. You have, you know, reusable modules that can do pretty much whatever you want and you can um, parameterize them to your heart's content. Um, so, you know, my the title of this talk was, it's. It's React for your infrastructure. And mainly why I love React is that React is declarative. So in React, now I know it's, again, it's like Facebook spiel. I was at Facebook, I have no contact with them anymore, mostly, so I'm not being paid for them to praise React. But um, in general, um, in React you focus on what needs to be done. You, you write this little, you know, XJS or whatever that's called, um, and, it, you know, things just happen. You need to write a little bit of glue JavaScript every now and then, but like really it's, it's, it's as close to knowing, it's clo as close to saying what should it do as opposed to how it should be done as, as possible. Um, so it's declarative and it's modular. So you have small generic reusable components you have resources, which is your like basic building block, and then you can create modules, and on top of modules, you can create another module, you know, and, and it's modules all the way up. It's like in components, in React, it's components all the way down, and you know, in the real world, it's turtles all the way down. It's modules all the way down in Terraform, pretty much. Um, so a couple of concepts from Terraform world, before I actually show you what Terraform is. Um, Couple of concepts. Um, one of the main concepts is providers. And providers are generally wrappers around APIs. So if you've got AWS provider, it's effectively like an, an, a Go wrapper around AWS um, APIs. Um, similar with, you know, PagerDuty, similar with GitHub. They're all effectively just repeaters to, um, to the API. Um, and while well, I've been following Terraform since 2016, maybe f late 15, but I've been following them for a while and for 
until very recently, it felt like it's not done. Like, people have been playing with that, but it was like, mm, uh, I don't know. Um, recently, like, if you're working with the big, uh, the big dogs, like AWS or GitHub or Google Cloud, those guys have brilliant Terraform providers. You can, like, changes in APIs are followed by changes in providers in a matter of days, even if, if not hours. Um, Amazon is actually, like, they have their own internal team dedicated to, do, to doing Terraform. So uh, it's got really powerful support. Azure is another one uh, where Microsoft reportedly has a team dedicated to um, to Terraform, and they even said, look, we don't want to do our own cloud formation thing, we'll just use Terraform and be done with that. And uh, most importantly, it's actually easy to create your own providers. Because frequently what you're gonna see is, okay, I've got GitHub, I've got um, Heroku, I've got AWS, it's all nice and well, but I've got all sorts of like small systems that I need to glue together. So I'm not gonna use Terraform because it's a lot of work anyway, so ah, I didn't wanna have a partial solution. I don't have no solution at all. Um, good news is that it's really trivial to create your own provider, which is gonna give you a taste of how to do it. And a comprehensive framework is provided and very well documented actually. Um, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. The main concept, the most important concept in Terraform is resources. And resources are exposed by providers, so they're children, so to say, of a provider. And you can think of them as resources in the RESTful architecture, right? Let's say your EC2 server. You can create it, read details, update certain things, although you can't update a lot with EC2 instance, and delete. Same with your Heroku application, same with your GitHub team. Anything that you can think of as a resource is effectively you know, a resource in Terraform. Simple as that. Anything that is, you can think of as a resource in the RESTful architecture is probably a resource in Terraform. Um, it is by far the most important concept because that's the only thing that actually does something. Um, however, two more concepts is um, state and backends. So Terraform manages life cycle of resources. By managing life cycles, I mean it creates, reads, updates, and destroys, uh, but it only manages certain resources. So let's say you have an AWS account, and on that AWS account, a couple of teams are using Cloud Formation or, or a sysadmin who knows everything, and you know until he quits, you all depend on him. Um, but your team decides to use Terraform, and you're perfectly fine because Terraform just only cares about things that it manages. It has this file or this you know, repository that it calls a state. And the state is just a declaration of what the world should look like. Uh, or what the world currently looks like to Terraform, right? So when you um, change your code, um, what Terraform does, and it's, it, the main mode of operation is that it wants to reconcile what the world looks like based on its state and what the world should look like based on the code. Um, so the inventory that what the world you know, currently should look like is called state. What the world should look like after the change is the code and then the reconciliation happens. The state file or a state object is stored on the backend. And there's a number of backends possible, right? The, the, the simplest, um, Terraform backend is a file system on your local machine. You can easily, you know, just use a file. That's fine. Uh, most of the time, though, you probably want to work um, with your teammates. So you probably, you know, having shit on your local machine is probably not the best example of teamwork. So you might want to use something like S3, or if you're a Java person, Artifactory, etcd, console. Console is actually their preferred way of doing things. Or if, you've, if your company has a lot of money to spend, they can use their own backend called Terraform Enterprise. So that's it. The mode of operation is that it's a, Terraform is like a standalone CLI tool which reconciles differences. You tell it what the world should look like, you give it a state, and then it produces another state 
after changes are applied. It's very similar to things like Redux. You know, you can think of it as, as Redux. Okay, that's that's my state. That's the update. The the outcome is, is the new state. That's you know, basically that's that's how Redux works. Um, and Terraform run consists of two phases. Uh, the first phase is called plan, where when you introduce changes, or you actually don't introduce changes, which is an even more interesting um, thing, let me, let me say it in, in, in a sec. Plan basically shows you, if, if I run this code, if I tell you to um, you know, run this code, that's what the world's gonna look like. That's, that's the changes I'm gonna add. And when you're okay with that, you say, okay, now apply those changes. So you, you take the file that it created with the changes and you apply it. And that's where the differences are reconciled. Now, you might want to think of it as, um, as a change management system. But in fact, if someone breaks something, you might reapply your current state because, you know, I was playing around, I tried to fix this bug, turns out it has nothing to do with infrastructure, but I you know, mistakenly changed quite a lot of things and now our site is down. Now, because we have all stuff stored in a, in a repository and everything is versioned, I can just say, look, make it like it used to be. And without changing the code, you will actually change the existing infrastructure because existing infrastructure is the thing that changed behind the scenes. The typical workflow um, of plan and apply fits exactly into CICD pipeline. So imagine you can run Terraform plan for every commit and show the request, the, the status in the pull request. So basically make it uh, part of your, I don't know, whatever you use, Circle CI, Code Ship, um, Code Fresh, Jenkins, you know the drill. Um, run. And then run Terraform apply when the PR is merged to the base branch. So basically make this step a condi conditional on, on a particular branch. This way, you know, everyone sees what's, what's changed. They can review the changes. Um, they see whether a pl plan um, succeeds or fails, because plans actually could fail if your input is completely nonsensical. Um, and then it'll be applied automatically. So, you know, it's, it's reviewed, it's, its version, you know what, who did what and whatever. So that's a typical workflow. I'm not sure how much you're gonna see, but this is an example of a plan phase. Um, I added a value to a field called container ports. The, there was nothing in that field before, it's a list. And now we can see that uh, Terraform will update in place two uh, resources. Now, the number of container ports will change and new port will be added, 1983, and the same change will happen in another service. And that's it, that's all there is. So now it, it says, okay, that's, that's what I would do if you told me to do it. Um, and then the apply basically does just, just, just that. So it says, okay, modifying, that's what I did. Modifying again, that's what I did. Apply complete, two resources changed. Thank you. It's done. It's done in a second each. It's not too bad. Right, so I showed you providers. They're probably, like you're programmers, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be coming here if you weren't programmers. Um, good news is that Terraform is extremely extensible. Actually, all I, why I love HashiCorp things is that there are very few of them and they want to make a lot of money so they allow people to do their job for them. Um, but they also allow extensibility so people can, can you know, bend their products to their will. And it's super easy to build a provider. In fact, a lot of those um, providers I mentioned were built by companies themselves. So Amazon builds their own shit. Azure is built by Microsoft directly, et cetera. Uh, in order to build a Terraform provider, you need to understand resource life cycle. So if crude doesn't ring a bell, you might not want to do that. Ideally, you probably want to understand REST because most of the APIs that you're gonna work with are REST. Although GraphQL, thankfully, is being more and more popular recently. 
you'll need basic working knowledge of Go programming language, which will take you two evenings probably. And you'll need intimate familiarity with the API you'll be wrapping. And that's the most important thing. You basically need to know the API because that's what you're going to talk to. Um, resource and provider APIs are ridiculously simple. Uh, for a provider, you basically set a schema. Um, so, you know, what that provider looks like, what, what, what fields it takes, so what configuration it takes, resources, which resources it exports, and how to configure um, the provider. So basically, like, for all of the providers I've been writing, it's basically a matter of um, setting up an HTTP client with the right, um, with the right headers, like authorization and whatnot, and, and endpoint. Um, then the resource, the configuration is, is, is a function that takes the uh, configuration of a provider and, and creates something that um, it will be capable of talking to the API, usually like an HTTP client or that sort of stuff. And individual resource, again, takes a schema, so all the fields that are available in your, um, in, in your resource. And then you need to specify four functions, create, read, update, delete, that's where your CRUD comes from. Um, and all of the functions look the same. I, every function, create, read, update, destroy, takes resource data, so all your fields pretty much. And interface represents the client, the HTTP client, or whatever that whatever it is that you're going to use to interface with your API, and you know the, the return value is an error, which is usually nil if everything goes right. Um, so that's as much Go as you'll ever need for Terraform, pretty much. Super simple, very well documented, um, approved. One gotcha when you're going to create providers is. And again, like I was bitten by it, um, big time actually, but so were other provider creators. Like for example, Cloudflare doesn't get it. Uh, but providers need to handle situation where resources that it manages will be ma uh, manipulated externally. So imagine like you create an <coughs> AWS resource, maybe an RDS database, and someone comes in and um, let's say deletes that RDS database through the console. Now what happens is your state file says there should be a database by this name. Terraform runs and says there isn't. Now if your provider does not follow the Terraform logic, it'll barf and some providers actually barf. Uh, what you need to do though is if a read operation on a known resource returns a 404, it's okay because what Terraform is supposed to do, if you think about it from like a declarative perspective, what it's supposed to do is, okay, that resource doesn't exist. It should exist. I should create one. So that's what the read operation should do. And if a delete operation on a known resource returns 404, well, that's okay. I was supposed to delete it, but someone did it for me. The world actually looks fine from my perspective, so let's just continue. It's, it's actually, it's a subtle thing, but I've seen a lot, a lot of providers getting that wrong. Okay, so that was Terraform. Um, I, I thought of doing a live demo, but because internet is kind of finicky and you need internet for Terraform, I decided against it to spare myself the nerves. So the pros, um, I'm, I'm just gonna discuss pros and cons and, um, allow you to ask questions. Um, the pros, it, that's what I'm basing off the uh, last couple of months uh, of my work with Terraform in a $2 billion company. The pros is that manual operations in areas that we um, use Terraform, they're gone. Manual operations are mostly gone except for an occasional pull request review for Terraform. Otherwise, nothing. We got predictable and repeatable infrastructure. Um, when you had an outage in Australia and someone, you know, fat fingered something in an AWS console <clears throat> and then followed up with a really bad uh, fat finger in Cloudflare, we just run Terraform apply and had that fixed in a matter of seconds. Um, 
And we got dramatically better with Velocity with Infra. Previously, having like a new RDS database or a new Elastic Cache cluster set up, it was, was days. Uh, it's minutes now. So people can, you know, pretty much shop for resources in AWS, <coughs> Google, wherever they want. <coughs> it's, it's become like a, an open field now. However, there are cons. Um, and if you think about it, if you start linking multiple systems, let's say you link GitHub, you link Amazon, you link Cloudflare, and you link some internal systems that we've got, that's what we've got, actually. Um, you decrease reliability, because let's say AWS APIs are 99% available. Now, GitHub is 99% available. Um, your APIs are 95% available, let's face reality it's actually multiplicative. So your <laughs> reliability, the ability to run the whole plan and apply cycle is, you know, the lowest common denominator of all the reliabilities. If one of the API services has a hiccup, your entire infrastructure is fucked. Um, it's also in bugs and individual systems start to have a ripple effect. Um, on Friday, AWS, you know, AWS when the, 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 the annual conference reInvent is coming. They're trying to please Jeff Bezos so bad, like they're, they're launching everything at the same time. And sometimes they just break APIs. So, and they improved an API by saying, ah, we don't need, you don't need like a, an AAM role for app auto scaling. So, you know, even if you pass an AAM role, we're not gonna apply it. Okay, but the Terraform provider actually assumes that it'll be provided and it, will read back what you gave it. So essentially, they broke their Terraform provider, which meant that they broke our entire infrastructure because we couldn't apply anything without breaking our op app auto-scaling. Um, and there isn't an easy way around except for patching the Terraform provider. Um, it's not difficult, but it's not something that you'd want to do under pressure, let me put it this way. And we had to do it under pressure on Friday afternoon. Um, so I'm, I'm not saying don't do it, but I'm saying books and individual systems have ripple effects. So having one giant Terraform repository where you do all things is probably a bad idea. If you're going to be using Terraform, think about separating it into different failure domains so that if your one domain fails, the rest is still healthy. Um, and providers can fall behind API changes. Now, that was more true before. That was true when either HashiCorp people or hobbies were uh, messing up with Terraform providers. These days, it's usually the companies themselves that create providers. So they're like, you know, when Amazon introduced Fargate, um, the, the API change was actually ready before it was announced, and they just pushed it within hours. Um, but sometimes, you know, sometimes some companies just forget and they depend on external contributors or external consultants like, you know, like myself to do their Terraform providers. So, you know, it's, it's always an extra layer of, um, of indirection. So be wary of that. That's it. Um, thank you. That's my email. If you need me to answer some of your questions, um, Offline, that's that's fine. And do you have any questions now? Dobrze, ja mam jedno pytanie, jeśli mogę powiedzieć. Mm -hmm. Rozumiem, że e, teoria pewnie jest taka, że nie musi, ale praktyka jest taka, że e, jakby ten agent teraz forma ma najwyższe uprawnienia do, do wszystkiego. I, I pytanie. Tak poza jakimś, nie, nie, nie idąc z jakiś skirmongering, ale czy to był problem kiedykolwiek w waszych doświadczeń, z waszego doświadczenia? My używamy Terraform Enterprise, mhm. więc generalnie ten, ten runner jest w bardzo zaufanym środowisku. Mhm. Wyobrażam sobie, że jeżeli lecisz przez Circle CI, czy jakiegoś takiego, szczególnie takiego... Przecie imprezową posługę. Tak, to... Ym, no to dajesz im tak naprawdę klucze do swojego królestwa. E, I ktokolwiek ma dostęp do tego projektu, może te klucze wyciągnąć. Więc powiedziałbym, że to nie jest problem o tyle, o ile wiesz, co robisz. Ale musisz zdawać sobie sprawę z tego, że 
że to jest ewentualnie słaby punkt. A, a praktykuje się jakieś takie rozwiązanie, w którym ten agent ma faktycznie jakoś tam możliwie przykrajane uprawnienia, czy po prostu z twojego doświadczenia w praktyce Tyce wszyscy i tak lecą na, na pełnych uprawnieniach. Nie, to, jakby to, jest nie, to, co, nie, nie to jest to, co HashiCorp sugeruje. W praktyce, gdybyś chciał mu przykrajać uprawnienia, to z każdym typem resursa, który byś chciał dodać, musiałbyś dodać mu najpierw tak, znaczy, uprawnienia. Wyobrażam sobie, że też ciągle to byłby problem, bo ciągle mm -hmm. by się okazywało, że do czegoś uprawnień nie ma. Więc... I teraz miałbyś ten krok, gdzie musisz, gdzie musisz zarządzać uprawnieniami do tego agenta, tak? Ale wyobrażam sobie, że możesz, dlatego że też Terraform zajmuje się na przykład takimi rzeczami jak stworzenie bazy danych, ale niekoniecznie dostęp do niej, tak? Więc, więc powiedzmy, możesz zrobić coś takiego, że dostęp idzie przez Volta, nie? Ehm, tak. Okay. Jest to temat, tak? Jest, jest, jest to jakiś temat. Super. O, jest pytanie, super. Ja mam takie pytanie, czy można tworzyć zasoby, które opierają się na jakichś danych z innych zasobów, czyli na przykład tworzę sobie aplikację na Heroku, dodaję do niej bazę danych i potem chcę postawić drugą, która ma tą samą bazę, znaczy w sensie jakiś tam jakąś zmienną z niej wyciąga. Czy jest to możliwe? Tak, e, tak. To jest coś, o czym de, de facto nie mówiłem, ale są dwa typy zasobów. Jedno, o których mówiłem, to są zasoby właśnie te resources, a drugie to są zasoby typu data. I data to są takie resources, czy, ale tylko do odczytu. I tam możesz powiedzmy zapytać e, zewnętrzne, nawet możesz po prostu wykonać arbitralne zapytanie HTTP i dostać, i on, i, i on to interpretuje jako JSON, tak? A mo można sobie w kolejności ustawiać, na przykład, że coś musi powstać jakoś wcześniej? Tak. Tak, jest, jest explicit, to możesz powiedzieć depends on, e, chyba, że możesz jeszcze taki trik wykonać, że jeżeli, e, może, wiesz, że te twoje zasoby eksportują pola, więc jeżeli e, on robi tak zwany dependency graph, tak, i jeżeli widzi, że zasób 1 korzysta z pola, które jest wyeksportowane przez zasób 2, no to zasób 2 musi zostać wykonany, zmiana musi zostać wykonana pierwsza. Tak, to jest, to jest duży feature, tak. tak. Okej, okay, dzięki. A jeszcze mam drugie pytanie. Czy Jasne. można Terraformem sterować jakoś programowo? Znaczy pomijając, że po prostu odpalamy przez jakiegoś języka programowania tam system, coś yy, w jakiś sposób? Mm -hmm. Terraformy są open source'owe, więc jak wejdziesz sobie na ich githubowe repozytorium, to masz taką cien cienką warstwę tego CLI, a pod spodem masz, e, masz API w Go. Więc możesz sobie po prostu zamiast, tego, zamiast tej CLI-ki możesz sobie zbudować swój własny interfejs i de facto my to też robimy. Okay, dzięki. Planujemy to zrobić. Super, dzięki. Dzięki.